Hi everybody, welcome to our video lesson on the theory of continental drift. And before we get started, what I'd like to do is take a look at a map of what the Earth looks like today. This map here shows the present day locations of all the land masses here on Earth. However, what if someone told you at one time that the map of the Earth looked something like this, where the continents and land masses were all connected together as one big supercontinent? Well, somebody did that in the early 1900s, and that's this man here. And his name is Alfred Wegener, who's a German scientist. And he made this preposterous claim about the supercontinent in the early 1900s. So what we're going to do in this lesson is we're going to talk about the evidence that he mounted to support this, this outrageous and extreme idea. So let's get started. If you open up your note handout, you'll find this in the middle, and at the top we'll fill in the definition of the continental drift. And Wegener's theory of continental drift stated this. It stated that the Earth's continents were once together as a super landmass or supercontinent and then drifted apart and still drift today. So he believed that they continue to, to move across the Earth's surface. So let's begin talking about what he proposed and the specifics of it all. Now, Alfred Wegener stated that the supercontinent, which he coined or named Pangaea, which means all Earth, existed. So we had the supercontinent here, which was then surrounded by one ocean around the world. And as a result, because he said that they moved, this supercontinent of Pangaea eventually broke up into two super land masses. We have the landmass of Laurasia, and Laurasia is actually composed of the northern continents on today's modern map. So we have North America here, and we have Europe and Asia over here. And then in the southern hemisphere, we had a super land mass called Gondwanaland. And Gondwanaland was composed of South America, Africa, Antarctica, India, and Australia. When he made this claim, he had a lot of evidence to support it, so let's get into the details of the evidence that he had. Some of the major pieces of evidence that he used involved fossils that were found around the world. And the four fossils that we will concentrate on tonight are Mesosaurus. Now, Mesosaurus is an aquatic freshwater reptile. And then Lystrosaurus, which is located over here, which, as you can see, is a land reptile. And then Cydnognathus, which is another type of land reptile. And then we have Glossopterus, which is a fern. So let's t discuss Mesosaurus first. Now Mesosaurus, as we said, is a freshwater reptile, so we like to live in the lake. And if you take a look at where Mesosaurus was found, it was found in South America, the southern tip, and then also southern parts of Africa. Now, the problem with that is this. If we take a look at the modern day map of today, you'll notice that South America and Africa are separated by a massive body of water called the Atlantic Ocean. Now, some people may think, well, so what? Mesosaurus could have swam across, and that's not a big deal. It lived in the water. But the sticking point is, Mesosaurus lived in fresh water. And fresh water animals cannot survive in salt water for very long. So it would have been impossible for Mesosaurus to make this trip because it wouldn't have survived very long into the trip across the ocean. So Mesosaurus helped support the idea of continental drift being, or saying that, these land masses must have been connected together or been very close together in order for Mesosaurus to populate the two different continents. So that's what we're going to write in our notes right now. So what did Alfred Wegener find? Alfred Wegener found this freshwater reptile named Mesosaurus in South America and Africa, which is separated by the Atlantic Ocean. And this supported continental drift because freshwater creatures can't survive in the ocean. So this suggests that the continents were together and then drifted. Other fossils that help support this idea that we don't have to write about here is that the presence of Lystrosaurus and Cygnognathus posed a problem. If we take a look here, Cygnognathus was located on South America and Africa. And as you can tell, Cydnognathus isn't exactly a swimmer. It doesn't look like a swimmer. Its anatomy is suggests that it was a very poor swimmer. And if we take a look at Lystrosaurus, his case isn't much better. He was located on Africa, India, and Antarctica. And again, if you take a look, his body is not designed for swimming as well. If we take a look at today's modern map, again, Cydnognathus was located in South America, and Africa. So it would have had to have traveled across the Atlantic Ocean to get from one continent to the next. And being that it's a poor swimmer, that is probably, most likely actually, impossible for it to have survived the trip, never mind a group of them to be able to reproduce. And in addition, Lystrosaurus is located here in Africa, India, and Antarctica. And again, Lystrosaurus is a very poor swimmer, and for it to be able to cross the Indian Ocean and the rest of the Indian Ocean on its way down to Antarctica would have been impossible. 
So in order for this organism or these organisms to populate these different land masses, they can't swim great distances. These land masses must have been together to allow the distribution or the travel of these organisms to the different continents that their fossils were found on. So again, Cygnognathus and Lysosaurus and their poor ability to swim and where they were found today help support the, the idea that the continents were once together and have drifted apart. And then that brings us to Glossopterus. Glossopterus is a fern that was found in North, South America, rather, Africa, India, Antarctica, and Australia. And there was a couple of problems that Glossopterus poses. Number one, again, if it's found on Africa, India, Australia, Antarctica and South America, it is impossible for their seeds to have either been windblown across these oceans or to have floated across all the oceans and then germinated and created populations there. So the fact that these continents today are separated by these massive bodies of water like the Pacific, Indian, Atlantic Oceans made it impossible for their seeds to travel that far. And in addition, if we take a look Ferns typically like warmer weather and they were found in Antarctica. Now if you take a look at Antarctica in today's map, you'll notice that Antarctica is all white and the reason why it's all white is because it's covered in nothing but ice. And because it's covered in nothing but ice, that means Antarctica is frozen. And if it's frozen, the ground is no good for plants to grow and the temperature is too cold for the plants to survive. So it would have been unlikely that Glossopterus could have survived in the current day conditions of Antarctica. So this suggests, again, that maybe Antarctica was further up and that these continents were together and then drifted apart at some time. So based on the information that Wegener found with Glossopterus, being that it was found on all the southern continents that are separated by oceans today, this supported continental drift for two reasons. One, the seeds would have been able, unable to travel across today's oceans. And then also, the plant was found in frozen Antarctica, which suggests that Antarctica must have been further north and then moved as the continents drifted away. Those are the two major fossils that we'll concentrate on here. And there's one more piece of evidence that Wegener used when it came to the fossils. So let's take a look at that. The last thing that he used the fossils for was the fossil distribution or where the fossils were spread out and found. And what he noticed is that when he put the continents together, the distribution seemed to line up pretty nicely. Sagnanathos is here, Lystrosaurus had this band here, Glossopterus had this band here, and then Mesosaurus had this band here. And it would have been highly unlikely, based on today's current maps, that if these organisms were able to, let's say, swim across the oceans and then also disperse their seeds across these massive bodies of water, it would have been impossible for them to coincidentally land in particular areas where once you put them all together, their distribution paths would have matched. So since their fossil distribution matched up really, really nice when the continents were together, this again suggests that our continents were together in one supercontinent called Pangaea. Now, in addition to fossils, Wegener used information from the climate and he used clues that we call climate clues. And one of the things that he used were glaciers. And if you know anything about glaciers, glaciers are massive sheets of ice that can cover up large areas, especially these continental glaciers. And what Wegener found was this. He noticed that in certain areas of the world, as you can see on this map, he found glacier grooves. And what glacier grooves are, are these. Glaciers, when they move, they can rip pieces of rock out of the ground and freeze them along the bottom, creating like almost like ice sandpaper. And just like sandpaper, as it moves across the surface, it scratches and gouges up that surface. Well, as these glaciers move across, these boulders in the bottom of the glacier would scour and create these massive grooves and channels in the rock that it was going across. These are called glacial grooves. So he noticed that one, there were glacial grooves on continents that didn't have the temperatures that were cold enough in present day conditions to support a glacier. And then also when he put these continents together, he noticed that these glacier grooves matched up really well. In order for this to happen, this again strongly suggested that these continents were together and had drifted apart after they had formed Pangaea. Our third piece of evidence are the climate clues. Wegener found that glacial grooves were found on several different continents and again, when the continents were put together, these grooves matched up, suggesting that the continents were once together and then drifted. Now, Wegener used obvious evidence too. 
And when he took a look at the shape of the coastlines of the continents, what he noticed is that the, the continents kind of matched up together and fit together like puzzle pieces. Because they fit together like puzzle pieces, again, their locations must have influenced the shape in which they had when they were connected together. So because continents like South America and Africa can fit really nicely together when put together, this again suggests that the continents must have been together and have drifted apart. So our fourth piece of evidence here is the puzzle shape fit of the continents. So certain continents seem to fit together like puzzle pieces such as South America and Africa. And since the continents seem to fit together, this influenced their current day shape suggesting that the continents were once together and then drifted apart. Okay, so now our last pieces of evidence that Wegener used and used rock clues and specifically he used rock composition which which is what rocks are made of and he used mountain ranges. So when we take a look at the mountain ranges we'll notice that we on the east coast of the United States we have the Appalachian Mountains and on the western coast of Europe along the shore we have the Caledorian Mountains. Now when you age the mountains out they kind of are the same age and then when you match up the coastlines because the eastern coastline of the United States and North America actually kind of fits pretty nicely with the western coast of Europe. You'll notice that when you put them together, the mountain ranges kind of match up. And if you know anything about mountain range formation, mountains form when two major land masses collide with one another, causing the rock in between at the point of collision to fold and buckle and move upwards. And that's how mountains are formed. So with that evidence, Wegener concluded that these mountain ranges match up nicely. They were aged at about the same time, or they were about the same age. So this suggested that the continents must have been together at one point and have drifted. And then when he took a look at rock composition at certain points of where continents met and they matched, he noticed that there were certain points where the rocks were the same on the opposite coasts at the same exact spots where they would have met. So again, because these areas had the same type of rock where these continents would have touched, this again furthered his idea and argument that the continents were together and had drifted. So our last pieces of evidence are mountain ranges and rock compositions matched up on opposite coastlines. And then since the mountain ranges and rock types matched when the continents were together, this suggests that they were once together and drifted. So this shows us a brief outline of the theory of continental drift and all the evidence that Alfred Wegener used to support this theory. The one thing that he couldn't explain though was how these continents moved and how they moved to their different places. So as a result, his theory was never accepted. And unfortunately for Wegener, this theory wouldn't be proved till decades after his death in the mid-1900s. So this concludes our lesson on continental drift. I hope you found this helpful.